Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I give you a progress update on my 17th century stockings that I am reproducing, as well as a peek at what clocks in stockings are all about. I'll also show you the final five breeds in my breed study of hand spun wools. So let's get started. So last fall, I started working on a long-term project similar to my long-term sweater project where I knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s, but this one is focusing on socks and stockings. And I'm particularly interested in the socks and stockings that common people were wearing. There are a lot of amazing silk stockings that you can find in museums and those kinds of collections. Those are worked at what I consider impossibly tiny gauges, like 20 stitches and 30 rows to one inch, which is 80 stitches and 120 rows over four inches or 10 centimeters. That is not something I have the fortitude. And the needle sizes are basically wires that are like half a millimeter. I, 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 I wouldn't get any pleasure <laughs> out of knitting something like that. I am more interested in sort of the wool stockings that, that people were wearing and the coarse stockings would be something that was knit at like seven, eight, nine stitches per inch, which is the kind of the way I knit socks today. So, um, so that is less daunting to me. And what I'm really interested in are construction methods and techniques and how things were done and then looking at how those kind of evolved over time. The current stocking I'm working on is a replica of the one worn by Gunnister Man. It was a, a body that probably was buried around 1700. It was found in a peat bog in the 1950s by a couple of guys who were digging up peat for fuel. He was pretty much gone except for hair and a few fingernails and a few bone shards, uh, but his wool clothing was intact. And it was intact in a really interesting way because like there were repairs, there were problems with it. Like he had, he had done some clumsy repairs of his own clothing. And so there's been some study of a, exactly how everything was constructed. And there was a description published in the 1950s about these stockings, uh, how many stitches there were, how many, how many times decreases were done over how many inches. Um, you know, the gauge, all of that kind of thing. So I've been working from that description in order to, rep, you know, to create this uh, replica. Um, there was a, a pattern published in Piecework a number of years ago that I initially thought, oh, maybe I'll just follow this, but I didn't agree with the interpretation of s several key th things about how it was going to be knit. So I just decided to follow the description and do it, do it that way. So last week I had, so this is the top of the stocking that goes up to the thigh and then it decreases down to the back of the knee. And then you've got increases for the calf and then they decrease down toward the ankle. So the, the, the calf decreases down to the ankle occur over a much longer period. So last week I realized I had made a mistake in calculating the decrease rate because I had misread um, the total length of the sock. So I just miscalculated the, the decrease rate and I had to rip back. <laughs> I had to finish that and then get to what are called the clocks at the ankle. And then that was the point where I was kind of going to be on my own because the foot of the stocking, the, the, the heel and the sole of, this, of the original stocking was missing. Uh, and the man had replaced them with other things that he had sewn to the instep of the stocking. There's a description of what it looked like in the state it was in when they found it, but there's not any information about what it might have looked like originally, like how the heel was constructed, how much the decrease, how many decreases there were to the final stitch count for the foot, how long the original stocking foot was, what kind of toe it was, none of that information. So I've been kind of, you know, trying to make my best reasonable guess about how to approach that. So I have gotten past the heel 
and I've finished the gusset and I'm, I'm ready to do the straightaway part of the foot. So I wanna to go to the overhead and show you what I've done so far and then also talk a little bit about some things that I'm thinking about I wanted to do, I might wanna do next because as soon as I finish this sock, I need to have the, the next uh, stocking that I'm going to knit and I don't know what that's going to be. <laughs> so I wanna talk a little bit about some of my ideas. This is what the stocking looks like so far. So it's very common, it was universally common at this point to have what was called a seam line down the back of the, of the leg. And usually that involved um, at least one column of stitches that were different. It could be a column of purl stitches, Often it was a column of garter, um, so you'd have a bump every other row and it would make it easy to track shaping rates. Uh, it also marked the beginning and end of the round. So this stocking is interesting because it has a different kind of stitch pattern down the back. It has a wider panel down the back um, that has some moss stitch and then some couple of columns of knit there. So that extends all the way down the back of the leg until the heel is begun. Now, Oftentimes, if you had just that single column, it would, it would be continued down the heel, but sometimes it wouldn't. So I wanna also show you these, what are called clocks. So there's this stitch pattern here along that goes down the ankles. So uh, there's a, a diamond that, they call it moss stitch, I would call it seed stitch, because I'm American. Uh, and then there's this inverted uh, pyramid or a triangle. And then there's this kind of um, moss stitch or a garter stitch rib actually. Uh, so it'd be two stitches of garter stitch alternating with two stitches of knit um, going down to right until the heel starts. So the heel is actually over quite a large number of stitches. It was 48 stitches wide and the gauge is seven and a half stitches per inch. So it's really you know quite, quite a wide heel. Um, then the heel that I chose to use is this shaped common heel. So you just work this rectangle all the way down to the bottom and then you fold the two halves together and what was common at the time was use, joining using a three needle bind off. So it's a shaped common heel because it isn't just a rectangle that's folded in half. There is this little bit of a corner cutting going on right here with some decreases. So this is the heel this type of heel is the one that was used in the Norwegian sock that I reverse engineered back in November that I released as a free pattern um, called Dagrens Luger. Um, very different type of sock, but this type of heel. This was a common heel, but it was like common literally for centuries. In the 19th century, you used to start seeing a lot more variation in heels, heel flaps, and then this one almost disappears, pretty much disappears in the early part of the 20th century. So I have a little bit of a gusset here, so after I picked up stitches, so I had to kind of figure out, you know, exactly how long I wanted to work this heel. The description in the book was that the leg ended at, I think, 20 and a half inches. From the thigh to under the heel, was 23 inches in length. So I had to kind of decide is it two and a half inches or not and with a shaped common heel do I want to have the two and a half inches and then do the decreases or do I want to have the two and a half inches and halfway through the decreases? What do I want to do? How many stitches am I going to need to have on the needles in order to have it be a reasonable size in proportion to this ankle because the ankle is pretty big. So that's one of the, the, the bigger the ankle is, the shallower the heel can be because you have, you just have more room. Because um, if it's a baggy ankle, you just naturally have more room across this diagonal here. So these are things that are just kind of playing around and, and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So I'm wearing these over my regular socks to give to give it to kind of fill in, but you can see that it's it's plenty roomy right here, plenty roomy for me. So this could you know absolutely fit you know someone with a much larger foot. It's too big for me, and I, I want it to be too big for me because it's meant to replicate something that uh, a man would have worn. So there's not a whole lot of positive is ease here, but look how much it could stretch. So someone could have a pretty muscular uh, leg and pretty thick ankle, and this would. Um, still fit them.
And then you can see uh, the clocks coming down along the side here. So I wanna talk a little bit about what clocks were. So in a wool stocking where you're just doing some texture that you know adds a little fanciness to the ankles. And if you're a man and you're wearing, your breeches are only at your knees, you're exposing your leg and so you want something fancy. And so women also had fancy stockings, but they of course were hidden by their skirts. When there were woven stockings instead of knitted stockings made from cloth, then they would have all these heavily embroidered what they called them clocks. I don't know why they're called clocks. I've seen a couple of explanations, um, but that's what the decorations along the side are. And then when silk stockings started being knit for the aristocrats, um, they transferred that. So sometimes they would be embroidered on or sometimes they would be knit in. And this is a type of heel that I'm very interested in understanding the construction. So if I can find examples of wool stockings that were knit like that, I would love that. But you can see that the heel flap is narrower right here. You still have some of that shaping right here. But instead of, of a gusset that comes down this way, they've got what they call a gore that widens right here to produce that extra width that you need to put across the corner here. And when you have just a photograph to look at, it's really difficult to understand the construction. The stocking could have been knit uh, flat or it could have been in two pieces or it could have been knit in the round until it was time for this gore to split. Uh, I think that these two halves, uh, you know, when, when they split here, that those were each knit flat. You can see that there is a seam line going all the way down. This isn't just like a decrease line. This is a seam line going all the way down here. So that indicates that the two halves are knit separately. And when I look in close, it looks like this yellow part was knit in the same direction as the green part, which suggests that stitches were picked up along the edge here and knit in this direction and possibly an increase done inside of the selvage stitch along here or a couple of stitches, a couple of stitches in from the selvage stitch all the way down. So if you look at close, you can kind of see that there's a, a couple of stitches here so that the shaping is inside there. So I think that this edge was then sewn to the other edge, I think. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Got two more stockings here. This one is very similar to that first one where you, except there's not other colors. and. So you can see that that splits this way and you can see that there's kind of uh, several stitches in between that seam line and this increase line right here. And, and I really do think that, some, that that is what was going on and that there was a seam going all the way along here. This, but not necessarily going up the back. You can see that there are little indents for shaping here but that doesn't imply an actual seam at the back here. It's like this one, I think, was knit flat. The entire circumference of the sock was knit flat and then it was seamed up the back. And then here you don't have a shaped common heel, you just have the common heel, which is just a rectangle. And for whatever reason, there's still some seaming down here that might've been a repair. And you can see the seam along here. I mean, this is a pretty sloppy seam job. So I do think that there was some sort of seaming going along here, but I'm gonna keep uh, looking and seeing if I can find some references. And I, I don't, again, don't wanna do this in silk, uh, but I would just like to understand how it works uh, and just try it out in wool somehow and see, see if I can make it happen. And the other thing about this, this looks to me like what's called a Balbriggan heel, which is a refinement, um, you have the, the common heel, you have the shaped common heel, which kind of cuts that corner. And then you have what's called the Balbriggan heel, which has uh, more than one uh, line of shaping and it creates another kind of a curve. And that was seen sometimes in these fancier stockings. So those are all things I'm looking at. If anybody knows of a reference that talks about how these were actually constructed, uh, please leave it down in the comments. I would love to know. I'm going to keep uh, keep researching to see if I can 
uh, figure it out. But this is this is the kind of heel. I certainly want to do a Balbriggan heel, um, but I also want to try this kind of um, a gore increase um, if, for a stocking to see how that uh, how that works out. So for the past five, six weeks, I have been working on knitting up squares from my hand spun breed study. So a year, year and a half ago, I began spinning 30 different breeds, a one ounce of comb top from each breed in order to really practice my spinning and just getting accustomed to different wool breeds and what they were like, what their qualities were like. So this has been really enlightening because it's one thing to, oh, I really like spinning with that. It's another thing to then knit with it and see what I think or to notice, oh, that's interesting um, that this wool has this quality and that one has that quality. But to really understand it and see what it's like when it's knit up, it's, it's really interesting. This is my last week where I knit the final five squares from my blanket. For each week, I've sewn the five squares uh, to each other, and now I have to sew all of the strips together and then label them on the back so that I can use it as a reference blanket. So let's go to the overhead, and I will show you uh, what these final five squares in the breed study look like. So this is what I have so far of my breed study blanket. So each week I have been knitting a five of the mini skeins of yarn that I had spun up. And then I go through what, what the qualities of the, that particular yarn was, um, what I thought of it. Um, and then after that, uh, I sew them together. I weave in all the ends and I sew them together. And then I move on to on knitting the next five squares. So these are the five we five weeks worth of squares um, that I have shown you so far, but now they're all knit together. And then I'm gonna have to knit the, the horizontal edges together in order to get the complete uh, thing finished. Um, so I have knit the top row of my plan, these right here, the finished Perrindale, Shetland, Polworth, and Swaledale. Uh, I've knit all those. I had a question in the comments a week or two ago about when I'm showing you the individual squares, have I washed and blocked them before I do that? So the answer is yes. Um, let me show you why. So this is the finish yarn and you can see it just wants to roll up into like a scroll. It wants to roll up on the horizontal edges. Now I can uh, force it to go this way instead and roll along the vertical edges toward the purl side. This is just behavior of stockinette fabric. So the garter stitch borders are preventing, you know, the, the edges from rolling, but it doesn't prevent the fabric itself from rolling. So if you've ever tried to, to knit a stockinette scarf and you've put border edges on it so it won't roll, it, it's so long and skinny that there's no way to overcome when it's hanging from your neck it's, its desire to roll into a tube. It's just what stockinette wants to do. But that's why we put borders on stockinette for cuffs um, and hat brims and hems and all that kind of thing is to keep the stockinette from rolling. When I'm going to sew all of these squares together, First of all, when I want to show them to you, I can't show them to you like this. You're not going to, to see what the fabric looks like. And secondly, when I want to sew them together, I would have to, you know, work at keeping it from rolling up while I'm trying to sew it. So one of the things that washing knitted fabric does after you have knit it is that it relaxes the fibers. It ha acquires more drape. Um, and it will lie flatter. So all of the, the, these borders are going to work once I have washed and blocked this. And it will make things easier to seam. I'll be able to you know, see how many garter ridges I have on, on this square as opposed to the number of garter ridges I have on the, another square which may have been knit at a different gauge. And so I can you know, plan how I'm going to seam those together. Um, but mostly it just makes this whole process of showing you what I've done easier and also doing the seaming. So every project needs to be blocked, at least washed and blocked one time. 
I say every, there's going to be some very, very few exceptions. Like if you're making something that's a, a piece of artwork and it's not something that's going to be a garment or a toy or something like that. There are very few things that don't need to be washed. But blocking just means shaping. And for a square like this, the only shaping I need to do is just lay it down and make sure it's not stretched out. So I'll get my six inch ruler out, make sure the dimensions are right. If it seems like it's kind of stretched out, I might just push it together a little bit. And occasionally I will take a T-pin and just pin a corner to kind of keep the edges a little more square to, to make, again, make it a little easier when I'm seaming. I don't have to shape it by pulling it. That's something that is done for lace items where you need to aggressively block it. But blocking just means getting it wet in some way and shaping it in some way. And that each of those things is going to depend on the fiber, what the final outcome is supposed to be, like what the use of the item is. All of those different things determine how it gets wet and how it's shaped. So these are the five squares after they have been washed and blocked. So I really didn't do anything other than soak them for half an hour, squeeze out the water, and then lay them flat lay my ruler, six inch ruler across in both directions. If it was a little too wide or a little too, you know, if it's a little too wide, then I, you know, pushed it together a little too long, pushed it together. If it wasn't quite wide enough, I pulled on it a little bit. Um, there were a couple of them where I put a pin in each corner at the top, otherwise just to kind of square them off a little bit. Um, but that, that was it. And so this makes it, it's going to make it much easier uh, to seam with. So, what we have here is Finnish or Finn Sheep, Perindale, Shetland, Polworth, and Swaledale. So I want to go through uh, each of those. I also want to talk a little bit about um, what's going on here along the top. So the way that my blanket plan worked out is that the bottom row were all of these long wools that were very drapey, very behave very differently from all of the other wools. And then these five rows were all yarns that behaved more like I would think of yarn behaving in terms of having a little bit of stretch and and that sort of thing. These like these really didn't have any stretch at all. So the other thing I did was I had grays at the corner corners and in the middle. I had browns here. And then these two right here were lighter colors and they were more of a brownish gray or just even um, just a different shade of natural than some of the other naturals. So there, there was this whole spectrum of natural starting with the eider, eider that was very yellow. And so for the natural whites, I started with the yellowest ones, the darker, you know, natural whites at the bottom and then went up to the palest ones. So the Polworth is the palest of all of them. Uh, and the Shetland just didn't quite fit into that spectrum and I needed something in the middle up here. So I decided um, that that's why the Shetland would um, be there. So I want to go through each of these five individually and tell you a little bit about my experience with them, spinning and knitting, whether or not I would spin or knit with, with each of these again in the future. This is the fin. This is the one that I showed you pre-blocked that was all rolled up. It has nice drape now. This I think is, it's one of my favorites just because it's so wool-like in a really nice way. It behaves the way I like wool to behave. It knit, knit it up evenly. I was able to spin it evenly. I like that it has a natural color. It's this kind of darker gray. But what I love even more about Finn is that it comes in just a gazillion colors. So this oh, wool, as the name suggests, it's native to Finland. And there it's called Finnish land race. Uh, here in the U.S. and other places, they call it fin sheep, one word. Uh, it's a type of Scandinavian short-tailed sheep, and it has similar color variations that Shetland uh, sheep have, which is also a considered a Scandinavian short-tailed sheep. I like that even more, that there are multiple colors, and it's just amazing. I'll leave a link down in the show notes to a PDF from the fin sheep 
Breeders Association, I think it is, um, that shows and explains and describes, um, there's tons of pictures, all of the different color variations that you'll see in Finn sheep. So as they were exported out of Finland to other countries in Australia, they breed them to just be white. So white is the dominant color. The colored ones are recessive traits. And if one of those pops up somewhere, they do not allow those sheep to continue um, breeding. Here in the US, breeders realize that hand spinners really like colored wools. And when you have a breed that has that expression in its gene pool, it makes it valuable as something for hand spinners where a purely white wool is going to be for commercial purposes because it can be dyed any color. So, you know, different countries and different shepherds, different regions are going to have different goals in terms of breeding and, and creating their wool. This is considered on the kind of fine end of a medium wool in terms of its coarseness. Apparently the lambs, so, so the first shearing is fine enough to, that it can be worn next to the skin oftentimes. But this is absolutely the kind of yarn that I would want for a sweater. I really like this a lot. It's smooth, there's no kemp in it. My knitting is even, my spinning was even. It was just a real pleasure uh, to spin and to knit. So the next one is Perindale. This is not quite the whitest of the breeds that I spun, but second whitest. It's a smooth yarn, it feels nice, it knit up nicely. You know, I don't have any complaints about it, but there's something, I don't know why it doesn't thrill me. This breed comes from New Zealand. So back in the 19th century, uh, Romney sheep, which come from the sort of the fertile hilly area of southeastern England, they were exported and brought into New Zealand, which is also a hilly uh, place with fertile ground, and they did just fine there until sometime in the first couple of decades of the 20th century when those hills weren't quite so fertile because of overgrazing. And so they decided to cross it with another breed, a hilly breed that does better in kind of not so great conditions. And that breed was a border cheviot. They put those together and it, like I said, it's a nice, it's a nice yarn. I mean, Romney is nice. I, I did spin with cheviot. I can't remember off the top of my head whether or not I liked it. Like I said, this is perfectly fine. If I had some that was commercially milled, I might knit with it, but there was nothing about it that kind of wowed me. And I'm not sure why, because it's perfectly nice. Oh, you know, the other thing that I found out about Perindale is that it does come in a range of other colors, some grays. So, uh, so that's not, I always like to know when sheep do come in another color. So it's possible that if I came across Perindale again, but in a color, that I'd be more enthusiastic about spinning it for some reason. The next one was Shetland. I was able to spin it fine enough that I had quite a bit of leftovers, more leftovers than I, I had for most of the yarns. I think there were only three where I had to wind uh, the leftovers on my big nitty knotty because they, they were just too much for the little ones because mostly I, you know, I can wind up the leftovers into something little like that. Uh, too much uh, Shetland for that. So I was able to spin it pretty fine and knit up fine, you know, you can tell it's a hand spun. There's some variation in the thin and thickness of it. It's an interesting natural color because it's not quite that creamy color. There's just this undertone and I suspect that has something to do with there being just more genetic variation in color among Shetland sheep. The thing about this is that it is widely available as commercially spun yarn. Woolen spun and worsted spun. Different yarn weights, billions of colors. I just feel like if something is widely available, why should I hand spin it? <laughs> so for me, that's an argument against spinning it again. Again, like the Perindale, there's nothing, I don't have anything against it, but I don't really see any reason uh, to spin it. And other people may feel differently. Some people may just love spinning with Shetland, and so they should do that. Now here we have the whitest of the wool breeds that I spun, and this is Polworth. So this is an Australian breed uh, created by crossing Spanish Merino sheep that were imported into uh, 
Australia, I guess, in the 1800s, and they do very well in many parts of Australia. What we're not doing very well on the southeastern kind of coast of Victoria, that's very rainy. The merino in the rainy climate, they were holding on to the the rain, and it would just stay in their coat, and then they would get fleece rot. It was terrible on their feet. Their feet weren't doing well in the in the wet conditions. And so they decided to cross it with a Lincoln long wool, which have much better feet for that kind of a climate. And uh, also don't hold on to the water into their fleece the way that the Merino um, did. And so they ended up with something that's three quarters Merino and one quarter Lincoln. And it is really nice. I have knit with Polworth before from wool. It was commercially spun, but it was imported from either New Zealand or it might have been imported from Australia. It was one of the two. Um, and I, I bought some at a yarn shop a couple of years ago. I'm like, oh, I've never heard of this before. Uh, and I'm always looking for other wool breeds. So I knit a pair of socks from it. Uh, and I really liked knitting with it. I enjoyed spinning with this. I would certainly do it again. Love it. And this family that created, the Dennis family that created these, um, this breed, the past few decades, um, they have been actually actively breeding the colored version. So this is another breed where if a colored one would show up, they would just um, pull it from the flock. They wouldn't let that breed. And um, the current generation, their mother is like, you know, let's, let's try doing this. And so there are quite a few natural colors um, that this does come in. Most of them are white. And there's one small flock here in the U.S. on the East Coast, and that's it. So in order to get Pullworth as yarn or as uh, fleece, more than likely you would have to import it unless you happen to see that shepherd at like Maryland Sheep and Wool or something like that. So uh, I like this quite a lot. I would definitely knit with this again and spin with it even. And I would love to, to look into some of the natural colors, uh, either in commercially milled yarn or in uh, for hand spinning. Either one uh, would be of interest to me. So this is the last one. This is Swaledale. It couldn't be more different <laughs> from Bullworth. So this is a, a breed that's from kind of harsh conditions in Northern England, like the Yorkshire Dales and Cumbria. These are hilly mountain sheep. They are adorable looking. They've got those curly horns, which I love. The sheep are white, but they have some black Kemp. So the color variation you see here is coming from the black Kemp. And the Kemp is those kind of coarse, coarse hairs um, that just kind of poke out and make this not something that really has a halo, but just makes it something that's kind of hairy. It's coarse to the touch. Um, this is a, a breed that's usually raised for meat. The, the wool isn't worth much, but if you were a weaver, you can make rugs out of it uh, or outerwear. Um, they also say it's good for things like bags and maybe blankets. It's not something I'd want to knit with again and wouldn't want to spin with again because you feel that coarseness in your hands as it's running through and it's just... It's not, it's not a pleasure to spin with. It doesn't mean somebody else wouldn't enjoy um, working with it, but it isn't something that I like. I do love the kind of color variation, but that is coming from that Kemp, which is those, those kind of coarse hairs in there. There was an amazing moment of serendipity earlier this week. Uh, I was had, had knit up 29 of my 30 squares were done. I had one left. That happened to be the Pullworth one and I saw oh the Knitters Guild meeting was Tuesday night and we meet by Zoom so we can have program speakers you know from anywhere and the program speaker was a guy from uh, Australia who was going to tell us about the Pullworth breed of sheep and I thought well that is so cool and so I was really looking forward to it. It turns out his family is the family that developed the Pullworth sheep. So they're the Dennis family. They're in this, a part of like southeastern uh, Victoria in Australia. And their family emigrated from Cornwall in England in like 1840. 
and they built a little homestead there, their original homestead. And sheep, people were, you know, the Spanish Merino sheep had been imported there and a lot of people were raising um, Merino flocks. And they weren't having much luck with it because where they live is so rainy that it just wasn't suitable for the Merino sheep, as I was mentioning earlier. And so it was their son, the couple that immigrated, their son developed the Pullworth sheep. Uh, and the family is still living there six generations later. They have uh, like visitor accommodations so you can be there. They have um, a, a dyeing studio. They have um, the, the mom decided to look at the, you know, develop the colored sheep into something that hand spinners would want, but also for their own yarn um, that they are producing and they do a lot of natural dyeing as well with with that particular line of wool. I'll leave a video down in the show notes. There's like a five minute video on their and, and their website too. So that's a way to get Pullworth wool if you're interested. It's just, it was a, such an interesting program to have right at the moment where I was getting ready to knit up this Pullworth. Uh, wool, and I was so happy that uh, we got to see him speak about it. And so there are Pullworth breeders all over the world now because, you know, sheep have been exported and, and I don't know if people have developed their own by crossbreeding merinos and long wool themselves to get their own Pullworth or if they always started with the, the original bloodline that the Dennis family developed, but they have... <laughs> Their original bloodline is still on their uh, their uh, sheep ranch there. So that is just so cool um, to know that this family has been doing this for so long and they've evolved their purpose and how they're doing things uh, as, you know, from generation to generation as well. Like I said, I'll leave a link to their uh, website down below if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the family who actually developed the Pullworth breed. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.